everybody coughs. Most of the time, we don't pay any attention to our cough because we think that, you know, this is something small. It's just something that the little virus is doing to us. We won't suffer very much. But when you're coughing out a substantial amount of blood, you should take this very seriously because this is a sign that something is wrong in your lungs. The lungs are badly damaged. And this could be, and this is also a common sign of tuberculosis, TB in short. So we all know that we can catch TB by breathing in the TB germ that's coughed out into the air by people who have lung diseases, lung tuberculosis. And this, these TB germs, when they get into our lungs, they can do two different things. One is they can go on to cause damage to the, lungs, to the lung tissues. And also, some, in some people, they spread from the lungs to other parts of the body, like the brain, for instance, the kidneys, the urinary bladders, and so on. But on the other hand, sometimes, in many people, in fact, in most people, the TB germs don't do any obvious damage. They just lie quietly in the lung cells. They go to sleep. Yeah, so the infected person doesn't know that he or she is infected, and other people don't see any signs of infection in these people with these silent infections. So TB that presents with obvious signs and symptoms, we call active TB. And TB that's quiet, that doesn't cause any obvious damage to the infected person, we call latent TB or silent TB. The problem with silent TB is this infection can remain silent for many months or many years or many decades. But when the person, infected person's resistance goes down, when his immunity is weakened by any cause, the silent infection can become reactivated. So silent TB now becomes active TB and we start seeing signs in the chest x-ray, for instance. And this active TB can become very severe TB. When the TB germ spreads all over the, both lungs, and in some people, like we said, the TB germs can spread outside of the lungs into many different parts of the body. Now, TB is a very ancient disease. We've seen, uh, we know of cells that resemble the TB cells in fossils that have been dated back to millions of years ago. And scientists have also found signs of TB infection in the re human remains from ancient civilizations, from the Middle East, from Egyptian civilization, from Indian and Chinese civilizations. But the germ that causes TB, yeah, mycobacterium, tuberculosis was discovered only about 150 years ago by a German physician and scientist. So with the discovery of this germ, it then became possible for scientists to invent drugs for treatment, specific treatment, and to use the germ to make vaccines to prevent people from getting um, TB. So, but it took a long time, many decades, in fact, for specific anti-TB drugs to be made. See, the TB germ was discovered in 1882, but it wasn't until 1950s that specific anti-TB drugs were introduced for use. Before the 1950s, doctors had nothing to treat TB with. Physicians would say, take plenty of uh, sunshine, fresh air, and take a good diet to build up your body's resistance. That's the only thing they can re recommend to the patients. And some surgeons actually believed in pumping air into the chest cavity to collapse the diseased lung, to allow the lung to rest and heal by itself. Right? So these are very ancient practices. But with the introduction of anti-TB drugs, of course, now we have a lot more um, drugs to use for treatment. And also, um, we have a vaccine called the BCG vaccine. Right? This vaccine actually is 
a live cattle tuberculosis germ. So the cow TB germ is very similar with the human TB germ, but not identical. But when we inject this cattle TB um, strain into our body, our body responds by reacting to this presence of this foreign material. And this body's response can also protect us against human TB, even though the response is to a cattle TB, but because they're cousins, the cattle TB and the human TB. So we also get protection from human TB. And this BCG vaccine that's introduced in um, 1921, uh, 21, got incorporated into many national TB control programs all around the world, um, around about the 1950s and 60s. And in Malaysia, our national TB program started in 1961, was instituted in 1961. And since then, we've been giving this mass vaccination um, using BCG vaccine to all our newborns in the country in an attempt to pro protect everyone from getting tuberculosis. So you would think that now we have specific drugs and we have a vaccine, so we should be able to control TB. But the truth is very far from this. So we see that today, TB is still very much around us. TB is still a main killer of our human uh, beings. And the world statistics reported by the World Health Organization says that every second of the day, you know, we have about one million, one new infection, sorry, reported every second of the day. And about one third of the world population is actually infected, currently infected. And out of this one third of the world population that's infected, five to 10% of infected people are actually having active tuberculosis. So they're infectious, they can spread the TB germs to people around them. And uh, TB is attributed, I mean, about two to three million deaths a year have been attributed to TB. So what's happening in Malaysia? What are our statistics like? Well, we said the national TB program, control program, was started in 1961. And for the next 20 years, from 1960s to the 1980s, you see a sharp drop in the incidence of TB, from about 350 cases of TB, fresh TB, in 100,000 population, down to about 60 cases per 100 population, 100,000 population. So this shows a very effective TB control program. And since the 1980s until about 10 years ago, until right into the 21st century, the TB incidence has been kept low, right, due to our TB program activities. But in the last eight to 10 years, from, the 19, from 2010 onwards until now, 2019, we are seeing the TB incidence climbing again slowly but steadily climbing again. So now in, in the, the statistics in 2017 shows that you know, now our TB incidence has gone up from about 60, 70 per 100,000 population to more than 80 per 100,000 population. So we don't quite know the exact reasons for this, but this is a worrying trend because now for the past five years, we're still seeing something like 25 to 27,000 new cases of TB every year in the country. So why haven't we been able to control TB? We have drugs, we have vaccines, what's happening? Yeah. Well, many reasons have been postulated, and uh, one of them is that this long latency, this long silent period of infection, because when people don't present with signs and symptoms, they are not treated. They don't go and see the doctors. Doctors don't know they have TB, and so they don't get specific treatment for TB. But the silent infection can be reactivated. They become active TB cases. And many people go to see doctors very late in the, in, in the uh, uh, disease. They, when they have a bit of fever, a bit of cough, they say, ah, this is normal. I'll get over it. I don't need to see a doctor. So they only go to see a doctor when they're really chronically coughing for a few months, 
they are coughing the lungs out and they cough out blood, which is the very a symptom of very late and severe TB. So during the, you know, um, the, 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 the period before they actually seek treatment, they have this chance of disseminating the TB germ to people around them because they will be coughing up the TB germs. Um, and also, t TB treatment t takes a long time. The minimum amount, uh, duration for TB treatment is six months. And the treatment can go on to 18 months, 24 months, or even longer. So this long duration of treatment makes it very troublesome for, for patients. They don't like it. They say, you know, I have to take my drugs every day for one and a half years, every day for more than two years. So many people stop taking the medication as soon as they feel a little bit better, fever gone, you know, I feel better, I can eat better, I'm putting on a bit, a bit more weight so I can stop my medication. But this is very dangerous practice because when you stop medication, you know, you're allowing the leftover TB germs in the body that are still alive to multiply. And when bacteria start multiplying, there's always a chance for mutation to occur. The genetic makeup of the bacteria can change. This is what we call mutation. And some of the mutational changes may lead to drug resistance. Yeah. So the development of drug resistance is quite closely related to non-compliance with medication. And this is a troubling um, development in the country as well as in other countries in the world. But I think the most important reason for why we have failed to control TB is that we don't have an effective vaccine. We've been using this one only vaccine, BCG vaccine, for a number of decades. But this B BCG vaccine is not all that effective. It cannot protect us against all kinds of TB. Right? So why is this vaccine not good enough? Because the protective efficacy is different for people at different ages and also people having different types of TB. So the protection is, seems to be pretty good uh, when vac the vaccine is given to infants, newborn babies, infants. The vaccine seems to be able to protect infants and young children from getting severe forms of TB, brain TB for instance. But the same vaccine doesn't do very much to protect older children and adults. So people can get vaccinated, but they can still get TB. So this vaccine doesn't seem to protect infection in all, all ages, in, in, in everybody who's vaccinated. But it is, they, do, it, it's, they do appear to be able to protect against severe TB. TB meningitis, TB that affects the brain, kidneys, and so on. So um, also, after vaccination, the protection that's afforded by this vaccine doesn't last very long. It won't last lifelong. It's not going to protect you for the rest of your life. Usually, the protective, protected period is only about 10 to 15 years. So 20 years down the road after your vaccination, you will have no more immunity against tuberculosis. And another reason is that not all BCG vaccines are the same. The first vaccine came out from the Institute of Pasteur in Paris, but subsequently, this BCG strain has been dis distributed to many different laboratories in different countries, in different companies producing the vaccine. So now we have many different forms of BCG vaccine. So when you get, you say you're BCG vaccinated, you don't know with which strains where the strains have come from. And these different strains have different protective efficacy. So it's not that everybody who's vaccinated with a BCG vaccine will get protected. And if, you can't, if the vaccine cannot prevent people from getting infected, it will not be able to stop the transmission of TB within the community. So what do we need? We need a more effective vaccine. That's common sense. The vaccine doesn't protect us. We look for some more effective vaccine. So we need a 
effective vaccine to replace the current BCG vaccine that we're, given to all, that, that we're giving to all our infants. We need a vaccine that can protect older children and adults because the BCG vaccine doesn't seem to do that well. We also need a vaccine that um, we can give to people who are already infected, not to people who are not infected yet to prevent them from getting infection. But vaccines can also be given to people who are already infected, who are having you know, silent infections, to prevent the silent infection from being converted to an active infection. We can also have the vaccine to give people who are undergoing medication. They are infected, they have the disease. The doctor has given them medication. So while we give them medication, we can also give them an extra dose of vaccine because vaccine helps people to do well on the medication. And also, we can give uh, the vaccine to people who have stopped, who have completed the, vaccine, uh, the treatment, because the vaccine can then help them to not to get recurrent infections, recurrent TB. Yeah? Because uh, the, sing, uh, the same person who is infected with, with TB can get TB many, many times in the lifetime. One episode, two episodes, three episodes. Because we have so many different strains of the TB germ around. Each new strain of TB germ can cause a new TB infection in the same person. Okay, so we've talked about TB control. We can, we, we, you've seen that we, at this moment, we still cannot really control TB well. Can we then hope for eradication of TB? Eradication means finish off the TB once and for all, wipe it from the face of the earth like we've, what we've done with smallpox. Now we don't have any more smallpox, right? So can we eradicate TB? So generally speaking, when we, uh, uh, in general, for a disease to be eradicable, if we want to eradicate it, the disease, the disease must not have any non-human reservoir. That means the dis this, this germ, the pathogen that causes the disease, must not be found in animals, must not be found in the natural environment in the water, in the air, you know, uh, in, in the soil and so on. And also, um, the disease must be clearly identifiable. It must have very clear signs so that doctors can recognize the disease and no scientists can recognize the disease. And so that we can, um, and also we must have accurate diagnostic tests to help us detect the disease in an infected person. Obviously, we must have effective medication, we must have effective vaccines to control the disease. So, look at TB. You know, does TB qualify to be an eradicable disease? Can we actually hope to eradicate TB once and for all? Well, we know that animal TB exists. There are lots of animals with TB, human TB-like disease. The animal TBs are not, again, not identical with human TBs but very similar. And it has been shown that people who work closely with animals, for instance, they can transmit human TB to the animals, the, the, the domestic animals, the cows, the elephants they work with in the zoo, the cats and dogs at home. And the animals, in turn, can transmit back the human TB to the handlers, to the uh, keepers. Right? So this is going to be a big problem for eradication of TB. And then we have silent infections. We say silent infections, no signs and symptoms, nobody knows who is infected. But these people are reservoirs for active disease later on and for transmission of disease to others. Accurate diagnostic tests, we have pretty good diagnostic tests for active TB. But the tests that are currently available for the detection of latent TB are not that good. Lots of false positives and false negatives. Effective medication, yeah, we have lots of drugs, anti-TB drugs, but the problem with drug resistance is increasing. So for some of the really extensively resistant uh, TB strains, currently we have no drugs, if no effective drugs for treatment. So that's a sad story. And, um, well, effective vaccine, we've said, you know, look at all the limitations of BCG, the only vaccine we have. So we don't, do not have an effective vaccine for, eradica for eradication of TB at the moment. But we can look forward to the future because in the last 10 years, there have been many candidate 
vaccines that people are working on. And uh, we know a recent publication has reported that a new vaccine is actually undergoing trials in some parts of Africa. And this new vaccine has been given to people who are already infected, people with silent infections, latent tuber tuberculosis, and has been shown to be able to prevent the reactivation of a silent infection to an active infection. So this is a new kind of vaccine, a new usage for the vaccine. Right? So this is very good news for vaccine, uh, for TB control uh, people. So lastly, I, I would like just, just to end by saying, it's obvious we have lots and lots more work to do. Right? And, um, but the whole world is working towards this common goal. So I believe that not in the not too distant future, we will be able to come up with control measures that can help us to eradicate TB altogether. Thank you.